Hi everyone, with the recent outbreak of COVID-19, everybody's in isolation at the minute um, and there's a lot of educational things online at the minute from many people and um, for that reason I thought I'd utilise my own skills and interests to produce a video on butterflies and bees and entomology as a whole um, from my home as I am in isolation as should everybody else be at home. Um, so the objectives of today, what I'd like to um, put forward is I'm going to talk about butterflies, how to class the classification of butterflies, the different type of butterflies you get, um, how to identify some of these butterflies, um, looking at my own um, uh, my own collection here, and some cool facts. Um, following this, I'll talk about bees and a similar kind of objective I'll talk about the different types of bees um, this will primarily just be looking at bumblebees not honeybees or anything like that because that would be a whole other um, lesson in itself to be honest because there's that much information regarding them some cool facts about bees as well and how to identify your different bees the most common ones you'll see in your garden um, I also want to talk about if you did want to start your own bee collection um, how to go about bees or butterflies how to go about preserving bees or butterflies you may find in your garden those that which are unfortunately have died and um, the same with butterflies how you spread the wings of a butterfly and how to preserve butterfly specimens so yeah, that's going to be today's objective. I also want to discuss how you can conserve and make your garden wildlife friendly. So that's what today I'm going to go through. So I'll start with butterflies. So I want to start with saying how you how a classification system goes. So I'm going to use the example of a peacock butterfly, which I do have an example on in my collection here. Let me open this. So if anyone didn't know, this here, we might need to get a bit closer with the camera, is a peacock butterfly. You might have seen these in the UK. Yeah, you can see that through my lens. Yep. Yeah. Camera, yep. Yeah. So the way you classify any kind of animal in the animal kingdom is using phylum class order family genus species. You might have not you might have seen this at school or or learnt it whilst at school. So for example, for the peacock butterfly we just looked at, it's in the phylum Amphipoda. Um the class insecta, because it's a type of insect. The order Lepidoptera. You'll have to. I have to apologise. It's all in Latin, and my Latin isn't that great. Um, its family is Nymphalidae, and its species is Aglisio. I think that's how it's pronounced. Probably not. Um, which is basically the Latin name for peacock butterfly. That's its common name. Um, so that's how, with anything, you classify it down from the phylum down to the species. Um, so you can see where its common ancestors have come from in the uh, evolutionary tree, if you remember that from school. So moving on from that, there's so many different types of butterflies in the UK alone. So I'm not going to, obviously, there's so many, I can't go through every single butterfly, but I will do my best to go through some of the main ones. So going through my specimens here, the main thing I've got in my personal possession are from the Nymphalidae family, so that's what we'll focus on primar primarily. Um, but there's so many different types. So you've got the 
Hesperidae, which are basically your skipper butterflies. I don't have one in my possession, but I'll try and link some information pages below so you can actually see pictures of them. Um, the Pupillionanidae, which are your swallowtails. They're the really pretty ones with the long bits at the bottom. The Pyridae which are your whites and yellows. Now I have got a small white. This is a small white specimen. It's not the best specimen. But that basically, you've got your big whites and your small whites. Your big whites look very, very similar to this. They were a bit bigger, suggested the name. But the big whites do not have the two black spots on it. As the small whites do. Now it's nice to get a quite a good look at this specimen because when you see them in your garden they're often in flight and you can barely see what butterflies look like so having a collection like this really gives you a good look at butterflies especially things like the the whites and the yellows which are often in flight. Then the should mention the whites and the yellow the whites the small whites, you find them a lot on allotments and stuff. So if you're growing vegetables in your garden, you might want to look out for them. It's quite good as well. We're just gone in spring. So if you are in isolation and you do have a back garden, please take a, take a minute to actually look for what butterfly species are in there because they are quite beautiful. We have the... Lysinidae, which are the hair streaks, coppers and blues. The holly blues, you've probably seen them really beautiful and you see them quite a lot in Wales. Um, I wish I had one in my collection, but I sadly don't. And the, the small blue butterflies, the holly blues are absolutely gorgeous. I suggest you go and Google this now from your phone. And you've probably seen them a lot around and thought, wow, they're really pretty. The Rydonidae are the metals and marks, metal marks, shall I say. And again, going through the Nymphalidae, which in two include your Fratellis, your Nymphalidae, and Browns. So I'm going to go through these a bit more because I have plenty of these in my collection. So I'm going to start off with the Painted Lady, which is a beautiful specimen. Because I actually found this one in a charity shop. It's not found by myself and it's very well preserved. So I can try and get this out of the box so I have a really better look at it. So that is a painted lady specimen. Now painted ladies are often found in dry open spaces. They can actually build a speed up to 30 miles an hour. And they actually migrate from Africa to the Arctic Circle and back. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail of this in a minute. Because that is a long way. Um, the other one is a speckled wood. I think this from my collection. The wing is a little bit damaged on this one. But this is a speckled wood. So it's your brown one. You probably see these quite a lot. All these ones I'm showing are very common. They're ones you'll find in your garden quite a lot and these are a real success story at the minute um it's quite a warm day today so they've spread a lot in recent years so they're actually doing really well and they're actually being successful due to climate change now i'm not saying climate change is a good thing but some species do well some species do badly so that's your speckled wood and you see them is quite a lot in your meadows and stuff as well obviously but they still would be found in your back garden and stuff so if you are in isolation I don't suggest you go out and look for these I guess if you're on your daily one exercise walk then you can keep an eye out um, and obviously when all this COVID-19 is finished you can have a really better look for them outside but you mostly find these butterflies in your garden anyway. So one of my favourite butterflies 
is the next one and it's the peacock butterfly and i showed you this earlier so if you didn't have a good look earlier i've got two of these specimens um but obviously one's in better shape than the other now if you actually have a really good look at this they've got two eye spots now this is really cool so the eye spots are to warn off predators so they're supposed to imitate that of an owl or something so any kind of of a bird or something that's insect smaller bird that's coming to eat them they they imitate that of its predators so to warn them away and the last one and then also one of my favorites that i'm going to go through today is if you can just close up to that is our small turtle shells and they're also really widespread and you might see these in your garden a lot i find that when people think of butterflies they do tend to think in the uk of the of the small turtle shell and you can get a large turtle shell as well which are basically just bigger versions of these um so they're mainly my butterflies that i'm going to go through now i'm going to give you some cool facts about butterflies because I really like butterflies and apart from being beautiful there is some cool facts about them so butterflies actually taste with their feet now imagine you being a person and having to eat your lunch with your feet it's really weird so yeah they taste with their feet which is both weird and pretty cool that's the thing about insects that they can be quite bizarre um their wings are actually transparent. Now they don't look it because it's like reflection of colours. I, I won't go into it too much because it's a bit more biological and physics related and I don't want to bore you with it, but please look it up because it is quite interesting. And it's probably why you don't actually see them when they're in flight. And it's really difficult to identify the species when they're in flight. Butterflies have actually been around for 56 million years 56 million years just think about that for a second take that in that is a long time um and one of the cool facts that i only recently learned which i think is really interesting sorry taking a sip of my coffee there is the way when we talked about uh, painted ladies earlier now, it's quite common knowledge that butterflies do not have that big of a lifespan. However, they do manage, so to actually get migrate from Africa to the Arctic Circle and back, it actually takes multiple, often takes multiple butterflies. And this is the same with the monarch butterflies, which are a bit more common in America. Um, so to actually get to do their whole migration, it's not just one butterfly, as you think, it's several butterflies that breed and stock off on the way. And then, but they still complete the whole migration circle as like natural instinct. Um, there's another thing I want to mention, which I've not got on here, which I think is really, is something that people wonder is, if you pick up a specimen, how do you know if it's a butterfly or a moth? Because they look quite alike, obviously. And the main thing you can differentiate between a butterfly and a moth is butterflies have kind of like, you know, when you draw pictures as a kid, they've got like the two blobs at the end of their antennae. So I do have, and I don't know if they've got their antennae on them actually. Um, you can have a look at the butterfly specimens. I think this one's got one of them. Yeah, you can see it more with the with that. Can you see? It's kind of got a clear like blob at the end. Now with the moths, now I haven't got a moth specimen I can show you which still has its antennae, sadly. But this one does, but the antennae is folded. But I think they've got one here. I don't think you are. they don't have the blob on the end, but it's actually quite like a, a feathered kind of look to it. So moths have like a feathery antennae rather than a blob and blob at the end of their antennae like a butterfly does. So that's how you know whether you've got a butterfly specimen or a moth specimen. 
So that's what I'm going to talk about about butterflies. I'm going to talk at the end about how you actually go about preserving them and building your own collection. But that's like your different UK butterflies you can look out for. So I'm going to have to have a sip of my coffee. I have got a little bit of a cough. So, so moving on, bees. I absolutely love bees. And in particular here, we're going to talk about bumblebees. I've got quite a collection of bumblebees because I find them quite a lot and I like them. Um, I should probably mention that everything in my collection, I do not kill. They're just stuff that I find because I think expired insects are beautiful. But I do not actively go out and kill them. Actually, the opposite. I, I try and save them. <laughs> um, so going through a kind of a similar process. So like the peacock butterfly, like any animal in the animal kingdom, how we classify. So... I've just done an example of a tree bumblebee, which are these ones here. They're quite distinctive looking. I've got loads of tree bumblebees. They're all these ones here in these two blocks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll have a closer view after, don't we, Rory? So the tree bumblebee is phylum amphipoda. So as you can see, the butterfly and the bees are both in the same phylum they're also both in the same class they're both part of insecta they're in they've got a different order because they're lipidopatera which is their butterflies they're both butterflies and moths whereas these are in order hymeremopatia i think that's that and they're in the family epidae their genus is Bombus, which is all the bumblebees, hence why you think Bumble Bomber, Bumble Bombus, quite easy to remember. And for tree bumblebee, their species, um, their species name, Latin name is Bombus Hypnorum, Hypnorum, I think, which basically is their Latin name for tree bumblebee. <clears throat> now, given that there's 250 different species in the UK, I am just going to go through the really common ones that you see in your garden, that you could probably see on a really nice summer's day like it is today. And I've actually been starting, I've actually been starting to see bumblebees come out. I saw my first bumblebee actually yesterday sat in my garden. Um, so it's really good time to actually start looking for your bees. Now. I can't really show you, I can show you kind of the buff-tailed and white-tailed bumblebee and this is because they look so alike that it's really difficult to dif differentiate between them. So they're both found in February and October and the only way you can really tell, but you can't really tell as much with the females, is the white-tailed bumblebees, the males have yellow facial hairs now this is an example of what could be and i can't tell you if this is going to be either a buff tailed or a white tailed bumblebee like i said they just look so alike that you can never tell the difference between them unless you really are an expert in the field um so if there's any experts in the field that can somehow id this for me i would appreciate it and please drop the comment down below um, generally the white tailed bumblebee, they, they, they tend to have like a really white tail. So this one, for example, I actually think is a white tailed bumblebee because it's, the back of it is just really bright. The, so like I said, when people think bumblebees, they really just think of the standard bumblebee, which is like the white tailed bumblebee. I think a lot of people don't realise how many different types of bumblebee are actually coming into their garden. So the other bumblebee is the early bumblebee. Now the early bumblebee is this big one here. Yeah. So as you can see with the white tailed bumblebee, they have a stripe down their thorax so if i can do an example of one so 
so they're quite similar looking so they have the white on the top but the main difference you can see with the early bumblebee is their tail area is a bit more of like the orangey colour at the bottom so that's all like the lines on the on their forex now early bumblebees if you're lucky enough to have any raspberries or brambles around that's when you really want to look for your early bumblebees because they really like their raspberry and bramble bushes and again the males have yellow face hairs on them i don't know if i've got any males you'd actually have to use the magnifying glass um to actually see if they've got the yellow hairs on them so one of my dis favorite bumblebees and it's very distinctive for this reason is the red-tailed bumblebee now here's an example of the red-tailed bumblebee so if you can get a close-up of that so they tend to be quite small let me just pop that back on there so they tend to be really small but they're fully black they don't have like the stripe on their abdomen as some of the other bumblebees have apart from their distinctive red tail so they've got that, so you'll find them if, on dandelions and bluebells, my favourite flower bluebells, you might find them in, so if you've got any of them in your garden. Um, again, garden bumblebees look very, very similar. to the buff tails and the white tails but the difference between a garden bumblebee and it's really difficult to show you on here but i do have a picture on my fact sheet here for identification so if you can look if you can zoom into here um whereas an early bumblebee white tail bumblebee and buff tail bumblebee have their white stripe just below here garden bumblebee will go across and kind of have this black crease in the middle So that's how you identify between a garden bumblebee and the other two bumblebees. Like I said, very subtle differences. A garden bumblebees, they forage deep in flowers, so you might see them right deep inside the flowers to get the pollen. And you find them on foxgloves, clothes and dead nettles and stuff. If you've got them in the back of your house, you might see some garden bumblebees. And again, they've got yellow facial hairs. So my last one is the tree bumblebees. Again, like we looked at these before when we were going through the different classifications and they're so distinctive compared to the other bumblebees. So they've got this kind of like orangey brownish bit at the top. So you can see the stripy, very distinctive colouring, coloration. And these are the most common bumblebees you see around, which is actually surprising because when you think bumblebees, you think the stereotypical black and white striped, but you'll find more of these in your garden. Um, tree bumblebees are actually found between March and September, and they're actually a new col uh, colonist, so that I don't think they're originally from the UK. Um, I think off the top of my head, they're actually from France, but don't quote me on that. Um, so they're like your common bumblebees you'll find in your garden. Now some cool facts about bees. 250 species in the UK. I'm going to try and find a specimen for you this. They have a cool sucking tongue. So some of my specimens still have their tongues out. Now if you can see any Andy with their tongue still out. That would be pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. So.
So they have this sucking tongue. Which is quite cool. I don't know if I can find the specimen which shows this. I should have probably pre-prepared this. Yeah. Um, no, my next point. So my next point is, is that they actually have they use their legs to pack pollen in a pollen basket. So when you find bees, you actually might find that they've got their pollen still on their legs. And you might see them like, with big sacks of pollen carrying around. And that's because like some bees as well, they actually don't have this pollen basket. But most, actually most bees will use their hairs on the back of their legs to carry the pollen around. Um, which is really important because they combine a lot of ecological services for us so when you think of everything you grow in your garden especially if you've got an allotment or something you really want to promote bees in your garden because they will pollinate your plants and survive plants they provide a really importance to our ecosystem and without bees food production and would go down and the government would have to spend a lot more money on food production because the bees provide a very free service to us, so be thankful for the bees if you really like your fruit and veg. And honey as well. But they're honey bees, not bumblebees. <laughs> You've got cuckoos. Now cuckoos, and you find this with a lot of species, are kind of known to be the minxes of the animal kingdom. So they will look very similar to the for a different species and what they'll do is they'll go inside their hives lay their eggs and leave and so they raise their babies thinking that they are their own and they're not and yeah and that's how they survive so yeah look up cuckoos they're quite minx minxy little things um not except bees are actually solitary and the most saddest thing is they've declined a lot in 50 years. This is due to the loss of wildflowers we have at the minute. A lot of people want these pristine gardens, which have all these plants in that are genetically engineered plants. And they will actually see the wildflowers as weeds and they'll pull them out. So in order to make a really eco-friendly garden for your bumblebees, get some plants i've got some and i should have brought them in here is bee bombs so if you get some bee bombs and if you're actually from new mills and i'm not doing this as a promotion or anything you can get them from pretty little things up new mills um you throw them in your garden and they will produce wildflowers uh, which are really helpful for your bees <coughs> so that's all about bees and butterflies and I'm just going to end this section with how you actually go about preserving them. So, if you did want to produce a collection like my collection and you're interested in that, and if you're not interested, you can switch off now. But if you are interested, then stay tuned in. So what you need for butterflies is this is called a spreading board. Now you can make this yourself. You don't need to buy this. It's really simple, just two pieces of wood that comes together like this and you put the specimen so I'll do this with this specimen here this moth specimen in here and what you do is you use some pliers to move it up now before you actually do this it's really important to relax the butterfly's wings now this is what takes the most time so what you do is you get a lunch box a sealed lunch box now those makeup pads you use to clean your face and get makeup, soak them in water and just make them, squeeze the water out, just make them a little bit damp, not so they're dripping wet and they'll ruin your specimen. Put that inside the lunch box. With that, seal the lunch box with the cotton buds and leave for 24 hours at very least, longer if possible. Now that will relax the wings, so it makes moving the wings up and down a lot more easier and a lot less fragile, it's less likely to break. Now you use some, I've got this here, but you can use just tracing paper, and you put this down here and you hold it in place like that. 
and what you do is you get so if i just rip a piece of this off you have got loads of some people actually say you you should um you can use really fine pins to actually pin the wings that i disagree with pinning the wings so you just hold it in place not actually through the wings because it's just damaging the wings and they can spread perfectly without putting pins inside the wings so i really wouldn't suggest this even though some people says that it's okay um and then you put a pin through you get different size pins through the middle of the butterfly there right through at the top so it doesn't damage any of the body now yeah you hold that on by the way you keep that on in place you might need to use several pins for at least 24 hours before taking it off so it holds in place um another thing that i'd always keep in your kit as well is insect glue so if you do make any damage to a really nice specimen you can glue the wings back on but it is quite difficult to do um Another thing you should have, but I've lost mine, is the blocks. So if you have blocks which come in three different sizes, and it just so it gets all the same level. If you want to make your your collection look a lot neater. Finally, what you kind of want is some place cards, so you can just cut this off real card. I'm trying to put the scientific name underneath. I mean, it's not necessary, but that's how they do it in museums and stuff. And it's kind of really good to keep up to date um, in what kind of specifications you've got. Um, what kind of specimens you've got, sorry. Finally, with the bees, the bees are a lot easier than doing the moths and the butterflies. The pin just goes straight through the centre of the bee at the top. And you don't need to do anything with the bee, such as spreading the wings and stuff. So they're a lot easier to preserve and pin. Um, it takes a lot of practice to do the butterfly wings. Um, I, you know, damaged quite a lot of mine just trying to do it. And some specimens I just won't do it on. So this one I've decided to not spread the wings on because I think the way it's expired, it's nicer to see anyway. Um, and finally, it's all different with different insects, so it's really worth looking up. So for example, I've got a beetle here. Now beetles are up to the side is the best place to pin the insect um so if you do find another insect you'd like to pin such as like this beetle here um look it up beforehand on how you want to pin the insects the final thing i want to to discuss just quickly is when you do find like a specimen there's so many websites and i'll try and pin them at the bottom which is really for recording what we see so if you find something please record what you find through these record recorded agencies because this will keep up to date the records and follow the conservation of the insects you find and see how populations are actually doing um so they can classify them and see which populations are doing good or bad. Um, finally, if you did want to do moth surveys, which it's not really the time of year, but hopefully we're all out of this mess by October. So if October comes around, then get some wine, some cheap wine, and if you're young with your parents' permission, put it in a pan and boil it with a really load of sugar loads of sugar now get a thick rope and soak that for 24 hours in the sugar wine um hang it up and it attracts moths so i did this and i found loads of moths and it's really good because every year they'll do a moth survey so if you want to take part in the moth survey or bee surveys or butterfly surveys which are done every year then they're really fun to take part in and i'll try and post the link below so that's what i'm going to finish up with and thank you and i hope you learned something today and you actually found it interesting um please comment below if you found it interesting and i'll see what i can do in future but yeah thanks for tuning in bye